Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday, as well as upload onto YouTube every Wednesday as well. Now, before we get started into today's case, I do have something that I want to talk to you guys about a new idea that I am bringing to the table when talking about killer instinct and moving forward with the next couple months. Now, at the end of 2023, I really was brainstorming about different things, different aspects that we could bring in to Killer Instinct for the new year. Because in February, believe it or not, it will be coming up on Killer Instinct's five-year birthday, which is absolutely crazy to me. So when thinking about that, thinking about the new year, I was trying to think about new ideas that we could bring in. Now, I do want to disclaim that I know I am not the first true crime podcast or YouTuber to do this, so I don't take credit for this idea whatsoever. However, I thought it would be something exciting to bring into Killer Instinct. And that is for the next few months, I thought it would be a great experiment to dedicate each month moving forward to a different true crime category. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be a forever thing because obviously there are only so many categories that we can choose from. However, I thought that this would be something that we could do for the next few months and the foreseeable future. So just to give you some examples, this month would be unsolved cases. We would have one month based off of serial killer cases. One month would be cold cases. One month would be cases simply just from requests by you guys, the listeners. One month would be murderous women cases. One month would be international cases, so on and so forth. I think you get the drift. So if you can't tell, I've been a little bit type A lately, and this to me seems like a great way to not only organize the cases that we cover on Killer Instinct, but also a fresh way to start out the new year and a great way to switch up the types of cases that we cover on this podcast. Now, I do want to say I am in no way married to this idea. So if you guys are like Savannah, absolutely not. We're not into it. This is a no-go and you don't want it, then we won't do it. And that's that. And we will keep it moving the way we have been. But I thought that we could start the conversation, put the feelers out there, see what you guys think about it and move forward from there. And if this is an idea that we are liking, something that we want to do, I have decided that we are going to dedicate the month of January to unsolved cases. So for the remainder of the month, we are going to be covering unsolved cases. And then in February, we are going to be picking a different category. I will be announcing the new category of the month in the beginning of each month. And we'll also be looking to you guys to see what categories you are looking for types of episodes that you want to hear about. And if you want to be really interactive on that, if you want to be a part of that decision-making process, then you can go follow the Killer Instinct Instagram page, which is just at Killer Instinct Podcast. It's always in the description. So make sure you go ahead and follow that. That way you could keep up with the decision-making process there and give your input as well. So let me know what you guys think about that. That is just one idea that I've had in starting out the new year. So like I said, January is going to be dedicated to unsolved cases and we have a roller coaster of an unsolved case today. As you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the unsolved case of Michelle Harris. This is an absolute whirlwind of a case. It is one that I truly was getting stumped on as I was researching it. It's one where you think you have it figured out and then you hear something else, a different piece of the puzzle, and it really just changes your entire perception on the case. So I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Michelle Harris was born on September 29th, 1965 to her parents, Marsha and Gary. Michelle received her associate's degree from State University of New York. And after graduating college, Michelle went on to meet the man that would be her husband. This man was named Cal Harris. Cal Harris grew up being a star athlete in high school and went on to play for the men's lacrosse team at Hobart College. Cal and Michelle met when Michelle began working at one of the car dealerships that Cal's family owned in Tioga County, New York. Now, after getting married, Michelle and Cal settled down onto a beautiful 252-acre property in Owego, New York, but more specifically, Empire Lake. Now, the property itself is spectacular. Not only does it have a bunch of land, but they actually built the home on the property, and it had its own private lake. 
This was obviously a very big selling point for Michelle and Cal, who were both big, big nature lovers. They loved being outdoors and they knew that they would use it for years to come, which they did, especially when they began having children in 1994. Cal and Michelle had four children together. They had two boys and two girls, and they spent tons of time on that lake, whether it was fishing or any type of water sport, water skiing, jet skiing, tubing, The kids would bring their friends out onto the lake. It was just something that really brought everyone together. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Cal owned several car dealerships and did very well for himself. He was very successful in his career, and this gave Michelle the opportunity to be a stay-at-home mom and live a very well-kept lifestyle. Michelle is described by the people who knew her as someone who was very outgoing. She was always up for anything. She was very spontaneous. She was known to be very funny. She always wanted everyone to enjoy themselves and have a good time with whatever they were doing. And when it came to Cal and Michelle's marriage, in the beginning, everything was very idyllic. Again, they had this beautiful property. It really seemed like this fairy tale love story, so to speak. However, over time, there was definitely friction growing between the two of them. Cal was described as someone who was very type A. He loved order. He loved things done a very specific way. And this caused some minor strains in the marriage because Michelle was more go with the flow. She didn't need to have a strict order of how things were done. Now in 1999, bigger issues arose in the marriage when Michelle learned that Cal was having an affair while Michelle was pregnant with their youngest child. Now the woman that Cal was seeing was working at one of Cal's car dealerships. And despite the devastation that Michelle felt when she learned about this news, she did not want her marriage to end over this. Again, she was pregnant with their fourth child at the time. She really wanted to try and make her family and her marriage work. So she decided to give Cal another chance. However, this did not last very long. In November of 2000 is when things really went downhill for Michelle and Cal. It was this month that Michelle told her family that Cal had cut her off financially. And it was also in November of 2000 that Michelle began dating another man. Now, one month later in December of 2000 is when Michelle had officially asked Cal for a divorce. And according to the people who Michelle told this to, Cal was not happy with this news. Cal and Michelle had a nanny who worked for them at the time and helped them in watching their four children. And that nanny's name was Barb Thayer. And Barb recalls many loud arguments in the end of the year 2000, moving into the earlier months of 2001. And according to Barb, a lot of what she heard during these arguments arguments were Cal trying to talk Michelle out of divorcing him. Now, after months of arguments and trying to change Michelle's mind, Cal realized that he was not going to be able to convince Michelle to not divorce him, so he agreed to go through with the divorce as well. In June of 2001, Cal was ordered to start paying Michelle $400 a month, as well as pay for all expenses related to the home until the divorce was finalized. He was also ordered to give all of his guns to his brothers and his father until Michelle moved out and the divorce was final. Now, at the time of all this, Cal's net worth was sitting at about $5.4 million, and Cal offered to give Michelle a settlement of $740,000 as well as custody of the children. However, Michelle rejected this. Now, Michelle's divorce attorney actually advised her to remain living in the home that she had with Cal while the two were working through their settlements with their lawyers, which they did. They stayed in the same house but lived in separate bedrooms. Now, while living in the same house, they tried to divide up the parental obligations. Michelle also got a job around this time working as a waitress at a restaurant called Lefties. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Michelle had started seeing a new man in November of the year 2000. And I want to first, before we get into the details of Michelle's disappearance, take a moment and give you some backstory on Michelle's boyfriend. Now, Michelle's boyfriend at the time was a man named Brian Early. Brian 
Ryan was 23 years old and he was dating 35 year old Michelle Harris. Brian worked as a surveyor and began seeing Michelle in November of 2000. Now, Brian seemed very invested in the relationship with Michelle. He actually had a girlfriend at the time that he met her, however, broke off his relationship with the hopes that him and Michelle would end up getting married once Michelle's divorce was finalized. Now, Michelle told her friends that she wasn't interested in marrying Brian, but she did say that she was interested in having a long-term relationship with him, and that's exactly what they did. Michelle had a key to Brian's apartment. She kept some of her belongings at his place, and right before her disappearance, Michelle and Brian had even decided to purchase a home together that they were planning on moving into once the divorce was final. However, that never ended up happening. So now this brings us to September 11th of 2001, and obviously we all know this day as the tragic day of the 9-11 attacks. However, for Michelle and her family, this day holds significance for another reason. On the afternoon of September 11th, 2001, Barb, the family's nanny, arrived to the home that afternoon, and when she got there, she saw Michelle getting ready for work. She was running a little bit behind because her uniform for the restaurant was still being dried in the dryer, so she was a little bit scrambled, a little bit scurrying around, and told Barb that she had a headache. Michelle had told Barb that she had made plans to go into New York City on the second week of September of 2001. Now, obviously, having it be 9-11, Michelle and Barb were speaking about how there were probably going to be travel bans going into the city, so Michelle wasn't sure if her trip to New York would pan out or not. Now, the purpose for this trip was that Michelle was going to go and visit some of her college friends and just stay and have a girls weekend, but along with that, Michelle was going to bring some some of her jewelry into the city in hopes of pawning some of it off, including her engagement ring. She was hoping to bring in enough money to help her put down a down payment for the house that her and Brian were hoping to buy together. Now, despite the state of the country at this time, Barb claims that Michelle seemed to be in very good spirits this day. She actually seemed happier than she did in quite some time. Barb remembers Michelle telling her things that day like, quote, I'm finally getting my life back, end quote, and I can't believe how I feel. Michelle also told Barb that she had plans to meet with her divorce lawyer the following day on September 12th. Now, like I said, this conversation was all taking place while Michelle was scrambling and getting ready for work. So she gets her uniform, puts it on, grabs her belongings, and heads out the door. Now, on September 11th, Michelle's shift ended at approximately 9 p.m. However, when she was done with her shift, she decided to stay at the restaurant and have a few drinks with some coworkers before driving over to Brian's apartment. Michelle was at Brian's from approximately 9.30 p.m. to 11 p.m., and that is when he walked her to her car, said goodbye to her, and figured that she would just be driving home. So now we're in the next morning, September 12th, and according to Cal, when he woke up that morning, Michelle was nowhere to be found. He claimed he walked around the house trying to see where Michelle was, however, he could not find her anywhere. At about 7 a.m., Cal called Barb, the nanny, and told her that Michelle never came home the night prior and asked if she could come by the house and help him get the kids ready for school that day. Now, Barb lived about five minutes away at the time, so this really was no problem. She got up, got ready, and began driving over to Cal and Michelle's house. Now, while she was driving over and when she pulled into the driveway, Barb was surprised because at the very end of the driveway, she saw Michelle's car. Now, remember, this is a 252-acre property, so the driveway itself is not something small by any means. The driveway is actually a quarter of a mile long, so you cannot see the end of this driveway from the inside of the house. This is not a house where you look through the window and you can see the end of the driveway. It is very, very long. So Barb was very surprised when she saw Michelle's car at the end of the driveway. So she decides initially to pull over, get out of her car, 
car and look inside to see what was really going on here. When Barb looked into the car, she saw that not only was the door unlocked, but the keys were also still in the ignition. It was at this time that Barb got back into her car, drove down the Harris driveway, and walked into the home, which is when she saw Cal, who was already dressed and ready for work, and trying to scramble to get the kids ready as well. Now, when Barb walked in, she told Cal that she saw Michelle's car at the end of the driveway. Now, after telling him this, the two of them went down at the end of the driveway to check this out for themselves. Now, according to Barb, when looking at Cal's demeanor, Cal did not seem too anxious or worried whatsoever that Michelle was gone. And in fact, Cal told Barb that Michelle probably just went off to New York City like she had originally planned. Because as you remember, like I just mentioned, Michelle had plans to go into the city the second weekend of September. Now, when Cal suggested this, Barb was slightly confused because she didn't understand why Michelle's car would be at the end of the driveway if she decided to go into the city. Getting to the city from where Cal and Michelle lived was about a three hour drive. So for her to leave her car didn't make too much sense. And when Barb expressed that to Cal, Cal simply suggested that Michelle probably hitchhiked her way into the city. Now, Cal and Barb continued looking through Michelle's car, seeing what was inside of it, and that is when they found some clothes, some mail, some magazines, but that really was it. After looking through the car, Cal told Barb that they needed to bring the car into the garage, and also he suggested that they needed to get the car cleaned. And this was strange for two reasons. First off, why? Why do we need to clean the car? And the second reason that this seemed like an odd suggestion was that if something was wrong, why should we clean the car? Because you're damaging a potential crime scene if that's the case. Now, regardless, Barb drove the car back into the driveway, and that is when Cal left for work. Now, after Cal left for work, Barb called some of Michelle's friends to see if they knew where Michelle was. However, no one had seen or heard from her. Now, when Barb told Michelle's friends that Michelle was nowhere to be found, that is when one of these friends hung up the phone and immediately called Michelle's divorce lawyer. And when the divorce lawyer heard that no one had seen or heard from Michelle, that is when the divorce lawyer reported Michelle missing. Now, as you can imagine, because of the time frame that this is all taking place in, because this is the day after 9-11, this is September 12th, there was not much police force available. There was actually only two remaining investigators in Tioga County at the time, and those two investigators went to go see Cal Harris on the morning of September 12th while he was at work. Now, when Cal was met with these officers, he basically told them the same story, which was that Michelle never came home from work the night before. He also went back to his house with these officers and gave them permission to search the home, gave them permission to search the car as well, but told them that he wanted it back afterwards. That way he could give it an oil change, which was something that he claimed that Michelle neglected to do. So he wanted to be able to do that once they were done with the car. Now, ultimately the police were able to gather enough of a team to begin searching the property. They searched it with helicopters and search dogs. They had divers and and sonar systems into the lake. The lake itself was very large. It was 29 acres. However, they searched all of it. They also interviewed all of the staff at the Lefty's restaurant where Michelle worked and talked to some of her coworkers. And they confirmed the story that Michelle stayed after work after her shift to have some drinks. And there were some suspicions about some of the coworkers that Michelle worked with because they had a little bit of a checkered past, a little bit of a checkered background when it came to the law. But regardless of their past, there really was no evidence at the time connecting them to Michelle's disappearance. So they really had to move on in their investigation. And that is what led them back to Cal. Because at this point, police could not think or see any other motive when it came to anyone else wanting to hurt Michelle. Once police learned more and more about Michelle and Cal's divorce and the nastiness and the ugliness and the tension that was coming from this specific divorce, it became more and more clear to police that Cal really was the only one in their eyes who had a plausible motive in this case. Now, the theories surrounded Cal were strengthened when several days after Michelle's disappearance, there was a senior investigator who arrived to the Harris household to do a search through the property 
And upon arrival, he found blood stains, multiple blood stains in the house. These blood stains were found in the doorway that led from the house into the garage. He also found blood stains on the floor of the garage and small traces of blood on the carpet that was kept in the kitchen of the home. All in all, there were about 60 drops of blood collected. And when police sent this blood off for testing, the blood came back as a positive match to Michelle. Now, even though there was not enough evidence to prove when this blood or how old this blood was, this really was the smoking gun that gave police the green light to go ahead and arrest Cal. So in September of 2005, so four years after Michelle's disappearance, Cal was arrested for second degree murder. Now, Cal immediately pled not guilty to this, which meant that this case was going to trial. Now, this trial was going to be more difficult than your average murder trial, if there even is such a thing, because several things were missing in this case. First off, Michelle was still missing. Trying to prove murder when there is no body is incredibly, incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to prove motive. It's incredibly difficult to provide physical evidence. And also there was no murder weapon found. So with no body and no murder weapon, it was going to be incredibly difficult for the prosecution to win this case. Now, I do want to jump in and just point out before we get further into this case, this from the very beginning, there was never a question in this case of whether or not Michelle went missing voluntarily. There was never a doubt, never a question of whether or not Michelle would leave her kids. Everyone who knew Michelle knew that Michelle was not going to up and leave her children. Even though she was having problems in her marriage, she was not going to voluntarily leave her children. Now, along with that, Michelle's boyfriend, Brian, was not really looked into very much in this case either. And we're going to get into Brian further on in this in this investigation and as we continue talking about this case. But police never really looked to him as a potential person of interest. They questioned him a little bit in the beginning. However, after that, they really let him go and moved on in their investigation and really pointed all of their efforts towards Cal. And that is something that this case gets very much criticized for when talking about the details of this case is that a lot of people criticize the police work that was done in this case. They believe that this was a case of very sloppy police work and more so pointing the fingers at Cal because it was the easier thing to do rather than conducting a full-on detailed investigation, looking at every potential possible person of interest. Because you will see as we move through this case that Cal is not the only only person that was potentially involved here. You will see that there are more people that we look into as well. So I just kind of wanted to paint that picture before we get into the first trial here. Now, the DA in this first trial was a man named Jerry Keene, and the prosecution was really trying to paint the picture that Cal murdered Michelle on the late night hours of September 11th, 2001, and disposed of her body while the children were asleep in the house. Now, now, the prosecution painted Cal in this trial as a man who was obsessed with control, someone who needed control in every aspect of his life. He was in control of his business, his home, his finances, and every other facet. They also painted him as a very volatile person, and they did have some pretty damning evidence to back this up. Now, over the course of their marriage and through their divorce, Michelle had actually kept notes over time of things Cal said or did that she considered to be abusive behavior. In these notes, Michelle claims that Cal told her, quote, I wouldn't need a gun to kill you, and if I did kill you, they'll never find your body end quote. Now that's a pretty strong statement. I think that we can all agree that that is a pretty strong statement and the prosecution really honed in on this because regardless of whether Cal was guilty or not, this ended up being true. Michelle went missing and her body was never found. Now the nanny Barb testified in this first trial as well, recounting the series of events that I just told you that happened on September 11th, going into September 12th. And she really emphasized in this trial that Cal did not seem worried about Michelle. Now, granted, one could say that Cal was not 
quote unquote worried about Michelle because they were going through a bitter divorce. He knew that she had this new boyfriend. She kind of, you know, they were living two separate lives at this point under the same roof. However, you could also say that regardless of any of that, these two were married at one point and they should have some sort of respect for one another to be worried about their whereabouts. There's two arguments to be made there. But from the prosecution standpoint, they argued that all of these little things, starting from Cal's nonchalant behavior to finding the car at the end of the driveway, moving it into the garage, wanting to clean it, you know, all the things he said to Michelle, the prosecution really painted this as a domino effect that led to Cal's guilt. They also stated how the police themselves noticed Cal's nonchalant behavior and how he seemed more concerned on getting the car back to get it an oil change and get it cleaned than he did about finding Michelle and figuring out what happened to her. Now, when looking at the motive, because like I mentioned, Cal did seem to have a potential motive. If there was anyone that had a motive in this case, it seemed to be Cal because Cal was going to have to pay Michelle a decent amount of money after this divorce. They were about to have to split up their assets and, you know, painting Cal as this control freak who doesn't want to split up his assets, who doesn't want to have to go through these divorce proceedings, who doesn't want to have to give up anything that is his, it paints the motive that Cal had a reason to want to get rid of Michelle. The prosecution also brought up the blood evidence as well in this trial. And even though it's unclear how old the blood that was found was, because there really is no way to tell. There's no way to tell when this blood was there, whether it was the night of September 11th, or if it was six months prior, a year prior, there's no knowing. However, there was blood there and the blood belonged to Michelle. The prosecution claimed that on the night of September 11th, they theorized that Michelle arrived home at approximately 11 30 p.m parked her car in the garage walked inside of the home and that is where the prosecution believes she was struck on the head with a blunt object by cal who was waiting for her inside They believe that after she was struck, she fell onto the kitchen carpet, which is where some of those blood stains were found. And they believe that Cal either dragged Michelle into the garage or Michelle herself ran back into the garage trying to escape Cal. However, he struck her several more times, which ultimately killed her. They then believed that Cal took Michelle's car to the end of the driveway and then walked back to the garage and figured out a way to dispose of Michelle's body while his children were asleep. Now, Brian, Michelle's boyfriend, did also testify for the prosecution at this trial. He testified that he met Michelle in the fall of 2000 and that the relationship progressed from there. He claimed that in the beginning of their relationship, him and Michelle would try to hide their relationship by using prepaid phone cards so that they could get away with calling each other without Cal knowing. Brian claimed that on the night of Michelle's disappearance, he said goodbye to her at approximately 11 p.m. and expected to see her the very next day. However, obviously, that did not end up happening. And according to Brian, he didn't say that anything seemed out of the ordinary that night. Nothing seemed wrong. Michelle seemed to be in good spirits. She didn't seem paranoid. She told Brian that she was going home and that she would speak to him later. And that is what he expected to happen. Now, the defense during this first trial, they really tried to swat down this theory. The defense claimed that the forensics were unconvincing because there was no body, there was no murder weapon, and they really tried to use that to their advantage in this trial. They also argued that the prosecution and police really just looked over other potential suspects and pointed their fingers straight at Cal from the very beginning. The defense claimed that Michelle was also cheating on her boyfriend, Brian, at the time, so there were other people who could potentially have been involved in this case and had other potential motives. They claimed that Cal's seemingly nonchalant behavior was just him trying to keep a sense of normalcy in his life for his family and his children and make it seem like he had everything together and to be strong for his kids. They also brought up the fact that Michelle was planning on accepting the $740,000 settlement. I know earlier I told you that she initially had rejected it. However, Michelle 
had told everyone in her life, her friends, the nanny, that she was going to be accepting the settlement. However, hadn't told Cal that yet. She was waiting to go to her divorce lawyer on the 12th to figure out how to proceed from there. And they brought that up to try and dismiss any motive that Cal would not want to pay Michelle or would not want to divide assets or anything of that sort. Now, after all of the testimonies and jury deliberation, the jury came back with their verdict. And this verdict was that Cal Harris was guilty. Now, with this conviction, Cal was set to go to prison for 25 years to life. However, something changed. Now, this is when a man named Kevin Tubbs comes into play. Now, Kevin Tubbs was a farmhand at the time who lived near Michelle and Cal. Now, according to Kevin, the morning after Cal was convicted and the story hit the newspaper, Kevin saw Michelle's face on the front page of that newspaper, and that is when he said everything clicked. Kevin said that he remembered that on the early morning hours of September 12th, 2001, between about 5.30 to 6 a.m., Kevin was hauling a load of hay that morning and drove by the Harris property. He claimed that the brakes on his truck were in poor condition, so he was driving slowly. And when driving by the Harris house, Kevin's headlights were on, so he was able to see a blonde woman and a younger man standing at the end of the driveway. He remembered there was a pickup truck, a black black pickup truck and a van right by them. So two cars at the end of the driveway and that the young man had dark hair and was a little muscular and also appeared to be visibly angry. Kevin claimed that the young man flashed him a look that he claims was a quote unquote, what are you looking at kind of look and that the blonde woman had her head down and appeared to be crying. Now, Kevin said that when he saw Michelle's face on the front page of this newspaper, he was without a doubt certain that the woman that he saw at the end of the Harris driveway was in fact Michelle Harris. Now, if this was true, if Kevin did see Michelle Harris at the end of the driveway on the early morning hours of September 12th, that means that the prosecution's theory of Cal killing Michelle on the late night hours of September 11th, that theory goes out the window. So Kevin got in contact with the defense. And when the defense heard this, the defense brought this to the judge and claimed that this evidence being presented beforehand had this evidence been presented beforehand, it could have changed the verdict. The verdict could have been different. And when the judge heard this, he thought that this was strong enough evidence to throw out the guilty verdict. And what this ultimately meant was that this case was going to be a mistrial. Now, the prosecution was absolutely blindsided when this happened. They thought that they were arriving to a sentencing hearing, and instead they're now hearing that the case was a mistrial, and everyone was floored. They could not believe that Kevin's story was strong enough to stand up in court. However, the defense and Cal were really using this to their advantage. Now, Michelle's family was not happy whatsoever. From the very beginning, they have believed that Cal was the one who murdered Michelle. It has never been a question in their mind. It's never been a doubt in their mind. They have 100% believed from the very beginning that Cal was guilty. And so to have this case go to a mistrial was a huge disappointment for them. However, the prosecution was not done with this case. They claimed that they were going to go ahead and try Cal for a second time. Now, there were a lot of questions that the public had when it came to Kevin's story. The first one was why would Kevin wait six years to come forward about something like this? And according to Kevin, he just claimed that he never paid too much attention to the case because remember the time frame is very different. We're looking at the early to mid 2000s at this point. So the ways in which we consume media are different at that time. And Kevin just said that he wasn't really keeping up with the case. And not only that, a month after Kevin's information came to light, there was another man named John Steele, who also wrote a letter to the court saying that he also drove by the Harris house around the same time that Kevin did and saw a man and a woman standing next to two vehicles. And the only new information that John provided here was that he claimed that he heard the man say, quote unquote, just get in the damn car. So now you have this case going from Cal being convicted. He's about to be sentenced 25 years to life to now these two men coming forward and saying, hold on, we have this new potential piece of information that could totally flip this case upside on its head. 
So let's talk about the second trial. So during the second trial, this was held in August of 2009, and the trial had a new judge this time. It was Judge James Hayden. During the trial, the prosecution pretty much presented the same exact evidence that they did in the first trial. But what was different about this trial for the defense is that they actually had Cal testify this time, something that did not happen the first time. Now, during Cal's testimony. He admitted to his infidelity. He admitted to minor wrongdoings in the marriage. However, he adamantly denied having any part of Michelle's disappearance. Cal claimed that leading up to Michelle going missing, Michelle was leading somewhat of a wild life, doing really whatever she pleased without Cal getting in the way of it. Now, the defense also brought up Kevin Tubbs, and not only Kevin, but also his parents. All three of them testified. Kevin testified what he saw the morning of the 12th and his parents testified to confirm Kevin's timeline of him getting up that day, him taking that route to haul the hay, and the prosecution cross-examined Kevin, and the prosecution took the standpoint and really argued it would have been too dark outside for Kevin to accurately identify Michelle. Now, the prosecution also brought up the fact that Kevin got arrested in 2006 for not paying at a gas station. This led him to getting arrested, and he ended up suing the state for false arrest and excessive force. So the prosecution really used this to their advantage and said that Kevin could have been motivated to make up this story in order to retaliate against police because up until this point, most people were a little confused, so to speak, about why Kevin would make this up. And so the prosecution gave the answer to that, saying this could potentially be Kevin's way to retaliate against police for what they did to him. And according to Kevin, when he was on the stand, he vigorously denied this and got visibly angry at this accusation. Now, as far as the other letter from the man, John Steele, who also gave his own account of what he saw, which was very similar to Kevin, John actually passed passed away in 2008, and they were not able to use his letter in court because the judge claimed it was hearsay. Now, after the jury took two days to deliberate, they finally came back with their verdict, and that verdict was guilty. Cal Harris was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life, and he was sent off to federal prison. So now we fast forward three years into Cal's prison sentence. This is in October of 2012. This is when the New York Courts of Appeals had actually turned over Cal's second murder conviction. Cal's lawyers argued that the trial judge made mistakes in his jury selection and also allowed hearsay in the testimony. And so because of this, when the Court of Appeals looked this over, they actually approved this and Cal was free again. Now at this time, Cal's kids were in high school. His youngest was in eighth grade and they were over the moon to have their dad back. After Cal was released in 2012, the police launched a tip line asking for people to call in information related to Michelle's case if they had it, because now they're back at square one. Cal was freed again. However, this was not over. Like I said, this was a roller coaster of a case and the prosecution was determined to take Cal to trial for a third time. And this leads us to March of 2014. At this point, Cal had hired new lawyers who went back and looked at old witness statements, as well as spoke to new potential witnesses of what could have happened that night. Now, it was when Cal's lawyers were speaking to new potential witnesses that they learned some more information that had not been brought to light yet. When talking to these people who were Michelle's coworkers and customers, they claimed that the people Michelle was hanging out with were not squeaky clean in the eyes of the law. Like I mentioned in the beginning, these people had a checkered past, they were people with criminal records, and not the most trustworthy of people, again, in the eyes of the law. 
But it was not only that, because Cal's lawyers at this time learned that on the night of September 11th, after Michelle left Brian's apartment, she did not in fact go home like everyone had painted this picture that she did. Everyone has been saying that after Michelle left Brian's apartment, Michelle went straight back to her home with Cal. However, according to these new witnesses, that was not the case. One of the witnesses reported seeing Michelle later that night and into the early morning hours of the 12th with a different man and he actually claimed that he was with them he was with michelle and this other man that night before he went home and left the two of them together now this new man in question that was with michelle that night he was a steel worker at the time and his name is stacy stewart now it is alleged that stacy and michelle were at a bar together because stacy was a regular at the lefty's restaurant that's how him and michelle met and the two of them began a sexual relationship. Now, Kevin Tubbs, the one who claimed to see Michelle around 5 30 a.m. on the morning of the 12th, he actually was able to pick Stacy Stewart out of a photo ID lineup. So he got a lineup of photos and picked Stacy out of this lineup as being the man that he saw with Michelle that morning. Not only that, as I mentioned earlier, one of the cars that Kevin saw that morning was a black pickup truck and Stacy owned a black pickup truck. Now, when the lawyer spoke with Stacy, Stacy claimed that he had nothing to do with Michelle. He also claimed that he had never been alone with Michelle, let alone had a sexual relationship with Michelle. He basically just claimed that all of this was made up and that he did not know her whatsoever. Now, with all of this new information, we now move in to trial number three, and this trial began in January of 2015. Now, interestingly enough, in this third trial, which again had a new set of defense lawyers for Cal, the defense was actually able to get some of the prosecution's information that they had been using as evidence up until this point thrown out. So in this third trial, the prosecution was no longer allowed to suggest that the blood found inside the garage and in the home were from the same time frame from when Michelle disappeared. Along with that, they were not allowed to bring up hearsay from witnesses who claimed that Michelle told them that Cal threatened her. So any threatening that Michelle claimed that Cal did, along with the blood evidence, all of that gets thrown out. And the defense also had its own separate set of hurdles because during this third trial, the defense's plan was really to set in on Stacey Stewart. That is who they were going to shift gears onto because all they had to do was prove that Cal did not murder Michelle. Without a reasonable doubt, they had to prove that Cal did not murder Michelle, and they were going to do so by arguing that more than likely it was Stacey Stewart. However, the judge really modified what the defense was allowed to present to the jury. The first one was that they were allowed to claim that Michelle knew Stacey. They were allowed to say that Kevin ID Stacey, and they were allowed to say that Stacey owned a black truck at the time, but nothing more. They were not allowed to say anything further about a potential sexual relationship. They were not allowed to say anything further about someone seeing Michelle and Stacy together that night. They weren't allowed to say any of it. So from start to finish, this third trial took three months. And in late April, the jury began their deliberations. And after two weeks of deliberating, the jury came back and said that they could not reach a unanimous verdict. So the trial was ruled as another mistrial. And so because it was another mistrial, Cal was free again. However, the prosecution wasted no time in saying that they were going to take this to trial again for the fourth time. They were not giving up. So this brings us to March in 2016 when this fourth trial began yet again. Now the difference in this trial was that Cal waived his right to a jury trial, which meant that the judge was going to be essentially the judge of Cal's fate. The judge in this trial was a man named Judge Richard Mott. And when the trial began, the prosecution added in a new witness this time. And this witness was a man named Gregory Farr. Now, Greg was also a convicted murderer who was incarcerated with Cal during his second and third trials during his time in federal prison. Now, Greg claimed that Cal allegedly threatened another inmate saying to this other inmate, I'll make you disappear like I made my wife disappear. 
However, during the middle of his testimony, Greg invoked his Fifth Amendment right and refused to answer any further questions. Now, during this fourth trial, the judge did allow to hear information about Stacey Stewart. So at this trial, he was able to hear more information about Stacey than the third trial allowed. Now, remember how I mentioned earlier that there was a friend who claimed to be almost the third wheel with Michelle and Stacey that night before leaving and leaving the two of them alone? Well, this friend's name was David and David was in jail at the time of this fourth trial and the defense wanted to put him on the stand. However, he claimed that if he was forced to testify, he would plead the fifth. So the defense basically said that they just weren't going to even waste anyone's time and putting him on the stand. So instead, they had the girl that David was dating at the time testify. Now on the stand, she claimed that David told her that on the night of the 11th, he was out with Michelle and Stacy, and when he left, the two of them were still together. Now, after David heard that Michelle was missing, David told his girlfriend that he assumed Stacy killed her and buried her in concrete somewhere. Now, there was also another woman who was friends with David and Stacy who confirmed that Stacy and Michelle were having a sexual relationship, and the defense attorneys also claimed that Stacy and David abruptly left New York shortly after Michelle's disappearance and went to Texas. They claim that he was actually in such a rush to leave the state that he ended up forgetting to pay the mortgage payment on the house that he had recently purchased. Now, Stacy also sold his truck shortly after Michelle went missing. However, the new owners of the truck allowed for it to be searched, and when they did that, they discovered blood stains in the back seat of the truck as well as the door panels. Now, this led the defense back to Stacy's home. After seeing the truck, they went back to his house where they discovered what they referred to as a burn pit. And when sifting through the uncovered fragments of this burn pit, they found a bra strap, swatches of a dark blue cloth, which the defense claims resembled Michelle's work uniform, as well as a fancy button. Now, the defense wanted to put Stacy on the stand during this fourth trial. However, they actually couldn't track him down. And even though the defense didn't theorize what they believed to have happened, with Michelle and Stacy, all they really had to do, like I mentioned, was prove that there wasn't enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Cal was guilty. Now, in this fourth trial, the prosecution emphasized that Stacy Stewart had no motive or reason to hurt Michelle and again pointed the finger back at Cal. Now, after this fourth trial was done in May of 2016, the judge spent 10 days considering the evidence before coming to a verdict. And that new verdict for Cal Harris was not guilty. Now, the judge really didn't give any explanation or any speech or reasoning as to how or why he came to this verdict, all he said was not guilty. Now, at this point, Cal has been exonerated and he cannot be tried again. It took four trials to reach a not guilty verdict. And in August of 2017, him and his legal team filed a 26-page federal complaint against what he claimed to be malicious prosecution. Now, even with Cal's not guilty verdict, it really only leads more questions than it does answers. Because even though Cal was found not guilty, the question of what happened to Michelle still remains. There are still countless theories out there of what could have possibly happened to Michelle. I know for myself personally, this case has been stumbling me ever since beginning research on it because I keep thinking of all the different possible theories when talking about this case. The one thing that I go back to when thinking about Cal on that night, looking at the theory, if we're looking at the theory that Cal was responsible for this, I have a hard time believing with four small children in the house that Cal would have been able to murder Michelle without one of those kids waking up. If we're following the prosecution's theory of Cal hitting her over the head several times, she's probably going to scream. She's probably going to let out some sort of noise. It's probably going to let out some sort of thud. And to think 
think that four small children or at least one of the four small children wouldn't wake up during that time just seems a little unlikely. It's not impossible by any means. I'm just saying that from my perspective when thinking about it, I do think it's a little unlikely that that would be the case. And then when we look at the other people in this case, potentially like Brian or Stacy, you know, it almost seems like there's too many people who are confirming this story about Stacy for it not to be true. You have co-workers, you have customers, you have other people who claim to have seen them that night together. Maybe Stacy and Michelle were out for the night and Michelle wanted to go home. Stacy wanted something more out of the interaction than Michelle did and Stacy retaliated against her after he felt rejected. Maybe there wasn't a sexual relationship at all, but Stacy wanted one, so he kept pushing and pushing and pushing until he ultimately allegedly snapped. We don't know what happened in this case, and that is what's very frustrating because after all these years, we're sitting at 23 years later in this case, and we still don't have the answers. Michelle's family still doesn't have the answers, even though to this day, they truthfully still believe that Cal Harris is responsible for Michelle's murder. They, without a doubt, have stood on that theory from the very beginning and have not shifted from it. They believe that Cal was the only one with motive. They believe that Cal was the only one with the resources to get rid of Michelle if he wanted to, and they believe that's exactly what he did. Now, I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case, so please let me know in the comments below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode we post weekly here on the podcast every wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it i'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys and until then stay safe bye guys